All right, I think uh, let's get started. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, our speaker for today, Professor James Moon, who is going to be talking about novel technologies for immunotherapy. Just by way of introduction, Dr. Moon received his BS degree from UC Berkeley and the PhD from Rice University and a postdoc from MIT. He joined the College of Pharmacy here in 2012. Currently, he is a John Searle Professor of in, in, in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Biomedical Engineering and Chemical Engineering. And he's interested in developing novel biomaterials to advance fundamental understanding of immune system. Dr. Moon has published uh, over 120 manuscripts, including those published in Nature Materials, Nature Medicine, Nature Nanotechnology, Nature Biomedical Engineering, Nature Reviews, and Material Science and Translational Medicine. He has over 20 uh, pending uh, or approved the US patents and uh, has started three new startups. Uh, so Dr. Moon is also a fellow of BMES, AIBME, and CRS. And we are very excited to hear Professor Moon to talk about novel technologies for immunotherapy. James, uh, all of yours. All right, thank you, Dr. Noreen Imadi, for a nice introduction. Uh, so today I'm very pleased to share uh, some of the ongoing work in my lab. Uh, where we are designing novel technologies for improving immunotherapy. And uh, we'll primarily focus on cancer immunotherapy, but we'll also discuss our uh, novel approaches to modulate the gut microbiome for uh, treating potential food allergies uh, at the end of the presentation. So this is my relevant disclosure slide. So let's discuss uh, how we are treating cancer patients. Um, so this is just showing patient survival curves in response to a traditional chemo and radiation therapy uh, that invariably lead to uh, fatality when uh, we have uh, advanced cancer patients. But with advances in immune checkpoint blockers, we now have a subset of cancer patients that are considered cured uh, without any signs of a tumor recurrence. And these monoclonal antibodies are revolutionizing how we are treating cancer patients. But as you can see in this curve, not all patients are responding to these um, uh, immunotherapies. So uh, we, as well as others in the field, are uh, trying to come up with a rational combination approaches that will improve the efficacy as well as safety of uh, these immune checkpoint blockers. So let's go into a little bit of biology before delving into the technical details. Uh, so when tumors are formed, uh, they release um, fragments of these tumor uh, cells. This could be peptides, polysaccharides, proteins, and they are picked up by immune cells that elicit um, uh, immune responses against those fragments. So these special cells are called antigen-presenting cells, and the main cell types in our body are dendritic cells that reside in lymph nodes. And in lymph nodes, uh, these dendritic cells will present antigens to uh, circulating immune cells, in particular T cells. And when uh, antigen-specific T cells are engaged, their numbers will expand and they'll enter blood circulation, and these T cells uh, go into the site of tumor and basically kill cells that are tumor cells that are expressing the same antigen the T cells are trained against. But within the tumor microenvironment, there's a lot of uh, negative feedback loop that basically turn off these activated T cells. And that's precisely what these immune checkpoint blockers are targeting. Uh, drugs such as Optivo and Keytruda engage these exhausted T cells so that they can re get reinvigorated and then uh, resume killing their uh, target tumor cells. But as we discussed in the previous slide, uh, not all patients are responding to these therapies. In particular, uh, the latest research across many different cancer types suggest uh, five to 30 percent of cancer patients are responding depending on cancer indications. 
And one of the major limitations of uh, these immune checkpoint blocker is that they uh, primarily work on pre-existing immune responses. They, they don't necessarily generate new type of T cells with a broader repertoire against the tumor antigens. So if patients don't have anti-tumor T cells to begin with, these immune checkpoint blockers wouldn't have good handle to expand uh, on T cells. And also within tumor microenvironment, there's a lot of mechanisms to block infiltration of T cells, uh, resulting in what we call cold tumor without any T cells to begin with. So therefore we need approaches to improve tumor infiltration of T cells to turn them into hot tumor without triggering any adverse events. So with that background, I'd like to discuss first project ongoing in my laboratory. Uh, where we are designing nanoparticles for achieving innate immune activation against the tumor antigens. So within tumor immunotherapy field, uh, this C-gasking pathway has garnered a lot of attention uh, based on very exciting data from many preclinical studies. Uh, so when uh, our immune cells detect cytosolic DNA, uh, this DNA could be either from uh, the pathogens that are engulfed into dendritic cells or tumor uh, DNA that's engulfed into the dendritic cells, these cytosolic DNA triggers a very potent immune activation. This involves uh, activation of CGAS uh, that catalyzes reaction between ATP, GTP to form cyclic dinucleotides. And in our mammalian system, it's a CGAN that serves as a signaling moiety and ligand for sting receptor. Upon activation of sting, it results in very potent type of interferon secretions. And in fact, this is very crucial for our antiviral immune activation. But also in anti-tumor cancer, these sting agonists can do uh, wonderful things. For example, intratumoral injection of a synthetic version of the cyclic dinucleotides uh, can melt tumors away based on prior studies. What we have, what other people have shown is that in these tumor models, intratumoral injection of cyclidinucleotides are regressing tumors and preventing tumor recurrence. So this has led to a number of um, academic labs as well as uh, biotech companies uh, into this uh, sting agonistic field. The first thing man compound was uh, produced by Ajuro. Uh, together with the Novartis, it's called ADUS S100, that went to phase one and two trials in head and neck cancer. Uh, while they showed uh, their ability to regress primary tumor, they were not able to show uh, treatments against the metastatic cancer. Uh, but there are still uh, 12 different, at least 12 different phase one trials ongoing with the different variations of these cyclic dinucleotides are showing uh, much interest in this field of sting gas pathway. But one of the major challenges of these conventional uh, sting agonist therapies is that they are primarily given locally into uh, local tumors. But we know that uh, direct local tumor injection precludes their utility against metastatic cancer um, because in advanced cancer patients, it's uh, mostly metastatic cancer that kills patients. Uh, what, what if you inject these uh, cyclic dinucleotides by systemic route? Uh, currently, it's not feasible with a conventional sting agonist because they are rapidly cleared, they are enzymatically unstable, and even if they reach some tumor cells, they have very low cellular uptake due to uh, anionic charges, uh, resulting in poor activation. And there are also safety issues of systemic injection of sting agonist. And importantly, in humans, there are many different sting haplotypes. So not all sting agonists work across the human population. So with the challenges uh, in mind, we have worked on uh, to address these uh, hurdles by developing a novel formulation. In particular, we came up with a nanoparticle system that can be given intravenously for systemic anti-tumor uh, activation. What we are doing is we are giving these uh, cyclic dinucleotide sting agonist uh, by liposomal formulations, uh, but we also add uh, manganese ions based on our discovery that manganese can synergize with the sting agonists. 
Interestingly, uh, manganese is a nutritional metal ion that we all consume from vegetables. We consume up to 10 milligrams of uh, manganese per day. Um, and there are also several FDA approved uh, drugs that has manganese as an imaging contrast agent. So based on this, we are developing uh, nanoparticles that can co-deliver manganese together with the sting agonist. And in the data set I'll show you in the next slides, we have shown that they can turn cold tumor into hot tumor, uh, mounting very strong anti-tumor immune responses. So let's go through this uh, project. Our work was inspired by this paper uh, where they have shown that upon DNA viral infection, manganese is released from mitochondria and Golgi, triggering activation of C-gasting pathway and protecting host against the uh, infection. So uh, we actually screened many different metal ions, including manganese for type interference secretion from bone marrow derived dendritic cells. And in fact, we saw uh, manganese has unique ability to activate type interferon. What's also interesting was when we add CGAM, this is an endogenous sting agonist, together with the manganese, we also saw a very potent synergy. So even down to very low level of uh, manganese, we saw good synergy in type 1 interferon secretion. We also saw synergy with uh, cobalt, but based on prior FDA-approved drug product that already has manganese, we decided to focus on that combination. So when we incubate human monocyte cells uh, and look for type of interferon, what we see is that endogenous thing agonist activates some level of interferon. Uh, but when you add the manganese together with the CGAM, uh, we see very potent synergy down to very low levels. And we have shown this in the second as well as third cell line that carries different sting haplotypes. In particular, the cell line shown in the middle is insensitive to sting agonist until you add a little bit of manganese where we see very potent synergy. What's also interesting is these three cell lines cover up to 92% of all uh, human sting variants indicating that manganese may offer a universal pathway for synergizing with uh, sting agonists. So these are generated with the uh, endogenous sting agonist. So what about uh, synthetic proprietary sting agonists that are being developed? We have also shown synergy with the manganese and the adro compound, the first in man compound that I mentioned, as well as the GSK compound that's undergoing phase one trial, DIBZI. A very similar compound is undergoing phase one trial, and we saw the synergy there. And also fresh human PBMCs uh, also responded well when we combine manganese with uh, sting agonist. So how does manganese synergize with the sting agonist? So prior work done in this field has shown that manganese can increase affinity between the double-stranded intracellular DNA and C gas, generating more sting agonist. And also the sting agonist, its affinity goes up in the presence of manganese, uh, potentiating sting activation. In our own work, we have shown that manganese itself can phosphorylate downstream protein to sting, activating TBK1 and P65, indicating that manganese has a multiple pathway to synergize with the sting agonist, uh, uh, upstream and downstream of the sting receptor. So given this, uh, we uh, decided to focus on this combination for systemic uh, immunotherapy. What we have found was when we mix cyclic dinucleotides with the manganese under certain condition, uh, they form nanocrystals but based on ionic complexation with anionic uh, cyclic dinucleotides and uh, manganese. And to stabilize the nanocrystal, uh, we add a polystyrene lipid nanocrystal itself is not stable until we add this uh, metal chelating um, a lipid component that basically wraps and stabilizes the manganese into nanostructures. And we coat the outer surface with a traditional liposomal component, cholesterol, DOPC, and pegylated lipid. And it's a platform that we call as a CMP uh, that has about 100 nanometer in size, diameter, zero-ionic in charge, and we can easily change the API from one to another. 
for example, we can put other proprietary sting agonist, or we can put our uh, off-the-shelf bacterial sting agonist. And we mainly have used the CDA, the bacterial sting agonist, for the remainder of the state studies. Major benefit of these uh, CMP is that it increases the cellular uptake dramatically. So when you look at dendritic cells that are incubated with our CMP, we see much better uptake compared with the free sting agonist. And that results in much more potent tabular interference secretion. Uh, so compared with the free combinations of uh, unformulated sting agonist and with and without manganese, we see much more potent activation of tabular interference secretion with the CMP. So let's turn our attention to in vivo efficacy. Uh, we have used many different uh, murine tumor models uh, to test their efficacy, and it's been working very well. So in collaboration with the Leo Lay's lab in dental school, uh, we have used the head and neck cancer model that's resistant to uh, immune checkpoint blocker therapy. Uh, in particular, this NOC1 tumor models are insensitive to even six rounds of treatments with immune checkpoint blockers, anti pdl one or CTLN4. But monotherapy with the CMP can eradicate tumors. So here we are giving four rounds of IV treatments that results in 80% eradication uh, and 100% eradication if we do local intratumoral injection. Compared with that, if you inject free sting agonist, none of the mice were uh, surviving beyond uh, 50 days. We have also compared the efficacy of our CMP in a cold tumor model, B16F10 melanoma, that's widely used. We wait until they are about 75 millimeter cubed and then give uh, three IV injections of our CMP. And it was out competing all the other comparison groups, including the GSK compound known as the industry standard sting agonists. Uh, Adro compound, the first in man compound. And uh, another control group we included was changing manganese to zinc, but otherwise keeping everything else the same, including the lipid and the, the sting agonist. This was more potent than other comparison groups, but because of synergy with the manganese and sting agonist, we saw stronger efficacy for the CMP. And liposomes without any metal didn't have a major benefit. We have also tested this in a spontaneous tumor model uh, that's closer to human uh, cancer biology. In particular, this is a triple negative breast cancer, MMTB-PYMT, that forms tumors starting 40 days of age. And these mice are very challenging to treat using conventional chemo and immunotherapies, uh, and uh, they are very poorly vascularized. Uh, so to really push the envelope, we waited until day 75 when multiple tumors are already present throughout the memory papad, and then give IV injection of our CMP. And by day 95, we saw a dramatic differences between the treatment groups. So our tre CMP treated mice were doing a lot better compared with the mice treated with anti pdl one that had uh, huge tumor masses throughout the body, as well as three times a larger dose of DIVZI. So 30 microgram of DIVZI treatments led to a uh, pretty large tumor burden compared with the one third of those 10 micrograms of CMP as shown here. Excited by these results, we moved on to large animals, uh, rabbits. Uh, here we use the Syngenic VX2 squamous cell carcinoma model where we implant tumors in sub -Q plank and wait 3.5 weeks. By that time, tumors are about five centimeters and then give I we give IV injection of our CMP. So CMP treatment led to much better tumor control against the primary tumor, as well as lung tumor metastasis compared with a three times a larger dose of the DZI uh, that didn't have much impact on the primary tumor. Uh, indicating the potency of our CMP treatment. Mechanistically, what we are seeing is the CMP treatment increases the pharmacokinetics and drug exposure in tumor tissues. So uh, if you inject free sting agonist, it gets rapidly cleared from the tumor tissue within an hour, 
But with our CMP, we see up to 13-fold increase in the drug retention in tumor tissue. And that results in much better delivery of sting agonists to uh, innate immune cells in tumor. In particular, after IV injection of our CMP, if you take the tumors out and analyze which cell types are phagocytosing them, it's uh, CD45 positive immune cells, in particular, dendritic cells, macrophages, and immunosuppressive myeloid suppressor cells are the ones that are taking up the particles. Uh, whereas if you inject free sting agonists, you see very little uptake among immune cells and maybe some uptake among CD45 negative tumor cells. We think this is uh, due to uh, uh, phagocytic nature of the, these antigen presenting cells within tumor tissue, as well as um, uh, increased uh, pharmacokinetics uh, and retention of the sting agonist by the CMP. So extended pharmacokinetics results in better uh, pharmacodynamics uh, as well. So in a large tumor bearing mice, we do single IV injection of our CMP and then took out tumors at six hour, 24 hour, or 72 hours after single injection. And we did a PCR to quantify immune activation in tumor tissues. And what you can see here is that even after just six hours, uh, we saw up to 600 for the better induction of tibial interferon secretion for CMP compared with the free sting agonist that had a very minimum immune activation. And even after three days of IV injection, we saw very proton immune activation in tumor tissues for the CMP group. So this uh, proton uh, PD results in very dramatic changes in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, in the same MMTB PYMT model, uh, here we are doing uh, single or double or triple uh, treatments, and we take out tumors after each injection to uh, analyze them for their immune profiling. What you can see with a simple, uh, a single CMP treatment is that after single injection, we see very strong infiltration of uh, monocytes and neutrophils into the tumor tissue. And by the second and third injection, these innate immune cells are getting cleared away. And by that time, by the third injection, the CD8 T cells make up up to 50% of all immune cells for the CMP treatment. And in particular, these are anti-tumor effector memory phenotype CD8 T cells are uh, known to exert um, uh, the cytotoxic potential uh, against the tumor cells. <clears throat> But if you compare that with uh, free sting agonist to treatments, uh, you, you see only minor immune activation and um, not more than um, a basal level activation of CD8 T cells into the tumor tissue. So we think the activation of both innate and adaptive immune responses are responsible for strong anti-tumor efficacy of our CMP treatments. And we have also done some mechanistic studies to understand whether sting expression is important among tumor cells or host cells. And what we have found is that as long as the host cells express the sting, uh, these uh, mice are responding well to our CMP treatment, even if the tumor cells downregulate sting receptor. And if you knock out the sting receptor from the host, they don't respond. And I think this is a uh, fantastic news because even if uh, tumor cells downregulate sting over the course of different treatments, the host immune cells will likely continue to express sting and our CMP would generate proton immune responses in uh, potentially in cancer patients. We have also scaled up the synthesis of our CMP and have done a, a study in um, healthy mongrel dogs. Uh, this was a big challenge because uh, these are about 20 kilograms. Um, uh, so with that required a uh, large scale synthesis of our, our CMP. And we have dosed uh, five animals so far where we have got given uh, three IV doses and increasing doses. Uh, they were relatively well uh, tolerated in terms of body weight. And we saw immune activation as shown by uh, increase in uh, the white blood cell counts in, in pre-BMCs. And we also saw some signal in liver enzyme, but overall they were readily well tolerated in, in these large dogs. 
So where are we going next? Uh, we have also done some studies in human patient samples as well. Uh, what we have done is we collected the peripheral blood monocytes from healthy volunteers and then analyzed um, immune activation among different immune cell subsets. And what we have shown is that the monocytes in the PDMCs are the major ones that are phagocytosing. These are CNP in vitro. And when we take tumors out from uh, head and neck cancer patients undergoing tumor resection surgery, and then treat them using our CMP ex vivo, what we see is a very potent type of interferon activation. Here we are showing uh, seven different patients, uh, their tumor fragments treated using either free sting agonists or our CMP. And in all seven patients, our uh, CMP led to most striking type of interferon activation, indicating uh, the potency of our CMP in human tumor biopsy samples. So to summarize, uh, we have developed a systemic uh, sting agonist nanoparticle system called the CMP uh, that uh, shows very potent efficacy in multiple immune tumor models, uh, rabbit models. And we are now uh, moving into canine cancer trial in collaboration with Michigan State. Uh, in particular, Michigan State has a large animal um, herbarium, uh, veterinarian hospital actually, uh, and they treat about 1,000 dog cancer patients per year. So we'll, we'll enroll uh, real canine cancer patients into the trial and give our CMP treatments and monitor their safety as well as efficacy. We are excited about that because compared with the mice that develop tumors within just a few weeks, uh, these dogs develop tumors over a decade, just like humans. So I think it will uh, closely mimic what will happen in cancer patients. And we also started a company called the Saros Therapeutics, uh, and we are uh, getting, uh, getting ready to test these in non-human primates. So with that, I'd like to switch gears and talk about the second project. Um, we are designing a novel uh, prebiotics that can modulate the gut microbiome and improve uh, immune functions. Uh, I'll first talk about um, uh, our approach in cancer immunotherapy, but toward the end, I'll also talk about uh, our approaches uh, in food allergy treatments. So in particular, the gut microbiome has garnered a lot of attention because gut microbiome is involved in uh, drug metabolism, uh, digestion, diabetes, and latest research also shows their uh, involvement in neurodegenerative diseases as well. So among these uh, exciting uh, findings, uh, recent papers, a uh, series of papers published uh, several years ago, also have indicated a major involvement of gut microbiome in uh, cancer patients. Collectively, what they have shown is that patients who respond well to immune checkpoints seem to have a beneficial or a favorable gut microbiome. What they have shown is that if you take fecal sample from patients who respond well to immune checkpoint and give that to germ-free mice, these mice also respond well to immune checkpoint, me meaning that the fecal microbiota from patients who are responding well to immune checkpoint seem to have uh, these beneficial microbes. On the other hand, if you take fecal sample from patients who fail to respond to immune checkpoint and give that to mice, these mice also don't respond well to immune checkpoint until you give specific microbial species. It, so it seems the microbial species hold the key to host immune responses against the cancer. And there are a number of clinical trials that's uh, potentially using fecal microbiota transplant from responders to non-responders to change the dysregulated gut microbiome in cancer patients. But as you can imagine, this has uh, numerous challenges uh, pharmaceutical challenges, regulatory challenges to make it into a drug product. So what we are doing is uh, we are trying to come up with a very simple approach to do the same. What we have came up with is a dietary fiber formulation that can be dosed orally. And in the project that I'm about to describe, what we have shown is that after oral dosing, this fiber goes into the colon tissue, providing nutrient source for these microbes that turn 
this dietary fiber into beneficial compounds, short-chain fatty acids. And when immune checkpoint blocker is given, we see very good synergy uh, in uh, different mouse tumor models. So I'll walk you through that project. In this work, we have screened uh, FDA's generally recognized as safe ingredients. These are uh, compounds that are widely consumed by the public from uh, other um, excipients or other daily products. And in particular, we focused on those that are known to have a beneficial role in microbiome. They include inulin, fucoidum from green tea, uh, fucoidum from uh, uh, seaweed, EGCG from green tea, and melatonin uh, um, OTC uh, that's been report reported to have a my uh, microbiome modulation approaches. Among those, we found inulin is the best. It's a polysaccharide that's found in chicory root and Jerusalem artichoke, and it has a sweet flavor. So food industry is using this as a fat and sugar replacement, um, and a lot of people are already consuming this. But when we found was when we turned it into a gel, we see better uh, pharmacokinetics in colon tissue and synergizes better with immune checkpoint blockers. So this is the screening study that we did. Uh, we basically implanted the syngenic tumor uh, away from the GI tract and subtube flank, and then gave an oral uh, injection of these uh, grass ingredients. And then we give immune checkpoint blockers as usual uh, in mouse studies, uh, intraperitoneal route. Basically, uh, what we are doing is uh, trying to see the systemic anti-tumor efficacy away from the GI tract of after oral garbage of these uh, FDA grass ingredients. And what's also notable is we kept the mice in normal child that already has a very high fiber diet. We are not taking away normal fiber we are just adding a little bit of grass ingredients on top. So this is showing the tumor growth in response to non-treatments or anti-PD-1. So with that anti-PD-1, we see more mice are regressing tumors. In particular, if we give oral garbage of native inulin with anti-PD-1 given IP, we see very nice synergy. Uh, up to 50% of mice are eradicating tumors away compared with just 20 to 30% with anti-PD-1 alone. So among all these uh, different candidates, inulin was the best, but one of the major limitation of inulin is, is that a native inulin gets rapidly cleared from colon tissue. And colon is our major target organ because uh, up to 95% of all uh, microbes in our gut tissue reside within colon. So that is our target uh, organ. So to increase its uh, colon retention, uh, we added a um, high concentration of inulin. And after a simple heating and cooling cycle, we saw them uh, turning into fiber structure, forming a uh, like gummy bear like a gel structure. And this seems to have a higher retention in colon tissue after oral garbage, as shown in this whole animal imaging with the floor for labeled uh, native inulin or inulin gel. After oral garbage, we saw better retention of the uh, inulin gel in GI tract compared with the native inulin. So inulin goes into GI tract and gets cleared, but with inulin gel, we saw increased um, uh, retention in colon tissue. So this re results in better synergy with the checkpoint. Uh, so this is same CT26 tumor model uh, where we give uh, native inulin, we saw synergy with anti-PD-1, but when we give inulin gel orally with uh, IP injection of anti-PD-1, we saw more mice are responding, eradicating tumors in about 75% of cases. We have also validated this using um, uh, tumor rechallenge model. Uh, so you can take the survivors and give tumor cell rechallenge, and they are 100% uh, resistant to, to tumor growth uh, indicating they are establishing long-term memory response against the tumor uh, growth. We have shown this works in mice obtained from many different vendors, including uh, Jackson Laboratory, as well as mice from Taconic Farm. And what that indicates is that even if the initial microbiome status is different from mice due to different diets and different source, they would respond well to our uh, combination trial. 
I think this goes well uh, to human cases as well, even if patients have a different microbiome status to begin with, uh, potentially inulin gel can uh, uh, synergize with immune checkpoint blockers. Uh, we have shown the efficacy of our combination trial in many different tumor models, including MC30A model, B16F10 melanoma model, and even in the orthotopic colon carcinoma model, uh, we see uh, the inulin gel plus anti-PD-1 reduces number of uh, colon adenocarcinoma compared with uh, untreated uh, mice that have a lot of tumor burden, as well as uh, inulin gel monotherapy or anti-PD-1 monotherapy. So inulin gel improves this, the efficacy of immune checkpoint. Um, another aspect that we are interested in is whether inulin gel can increase the safety of immune checkpoint blockers. One of the main side effects of immune checkpoint blocker is non-specific activation of T cells that start to attack uh, our healthy tissue. And number one side effects is uh, colitis like symptoms. And prior studies have shown that humans who consume uh, inulin seem to have reduced um, incidence of inflammatory bowel disease as well as colitis. So to test this idea, we uh, gave a DSS in drinking water in mice that uh, results in inflammation in the GI tract. And if you give anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4 in this uh, colitis model, it further ex exacerbates colitis, resulting in significant body weight loss. But in that condition, if we give inulin gel orally, we can prevent a significant body weight loss, and we can also reduce the shortening of the colon length, which is a marker for colitis in this model. And collectively, what these are showing is that inulin gel could uh, alleviate colitis, the major side effects of immune checkpoint blockers uh, in cancer patients. So mechanistically, what we have shown is that the inulin gel promotes expansion of beneficial microbes. Uh, if you look at the literature, in patients who undergo immune checkpoint blocker and analyze the microbiome in their gut tissue, what you see is the Acromensia, Lactobacillus, Rosiborea, Ruminococcus, their frequency is pretty high. So they are considered as a beneficial microbes. And inulin gel, in fact, in our mouse model is increasing the frequency of these beneficial microbes um, compared with anti-PD-1 treatments alone or native inulin treatment alone. So it seems like the cold and retentive inulin gel is uh, preferentially expanding these beneficial microbes. Um, we, we think that's because these are uh, metabolizing inulin and producing, uh, using that inulin as a major nutrient source and as a major uh, metabolite of that digestion, they produce short chain fatty acids. And I'll, I'll go into the mechanism of action, how that's impacting our immune responses. To test if it's really gut microbiome dependent phenomena, we added uh, antibiotics in drinking water. So that basically abrogates the um, efficacy, meaning that it's depleting gut microbiome and you lose efficacy of the combination trial. And also if you deplete CDA T cells, you lose efficacy, uh, meaning that cytotoxic CDA T cells are crucial for the efficacy of the inulin gel combination trial. So mechanistically, what we think is going on is, is that when inulin gel is given, it's digested by uh, microbial enzymes into short-chain fatty acids as uh, 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 metabolites. Um, to test this idea, uh, we basically use the GPR43 knockout mice, which is a receptor for short-chain fatty acids. And in this GPR43 knockout mice, we also lose the efficacy of immune checkpoint with inulin gel meaning that short-chain fatty acids are likely the main uh, potent um, mediators of anti-tumor efficacy. In particular, the inulin is digested and metabolized into acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Uh, so when you incubate CDA T cells in the presence of these, uh, the, the CDA T cells further upregulate their functional markers. Interferon gamma goes up, as well as the marker for stem-like CDA T cells, TCF1, uh, goes up. 
with uh, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Uh, what that means is that um, uh, these, uh, these short-chain fatty acids are expanding these beneficial anti-tumor T cells, and that's likely how we are seeing good synergy with the immune checkpoint. Uh, so in vivo, we also saw that. So in mice undergoing the combination trial, we saw higher frequency of uh, circulating anti-tumor T cells that's secreting interferon gamma. And we also see better infiltration of the, the T cells into tumor tissue. And they have the marker for stem-like CD T cells, TCF1, that's upregulated in tumor tissues. So collectively, what we have shown is that upon oral uh, digestion of inulin gel, it goes into colon, and they are digested by microbial species into short-chain fatty acids. And through GPR-43 and other transporters, uh, uh, it's uh, basically acting on the CD8 T cells to turn them onto better stem-like CD8 T cells. And when immune checkpoint blocker is given, we see uh, uh, CD8 T cells killing local as well as distant tumor tissues. So you may ask, if you give short-chain fatty acids as a drug, does it work? And our answer is no. Um, our data suggests that even if you add short-chain fatty acids in drinking water, it does not synergize with anti-PD-1, probably because short-chain fatty acids are very short half-life, less than five minutes, whereas a single oral garbage of inulin gel results in retention in colon tissue up to 18 hours. Uh, so we think inulin gel is providing continuous source of these uh, beneficial metabolites that's needed for induction of anti-tumor T-cell responses. So we are very excited about these uh, results because a lot of cancer patients are already on immune checkpoint blockers and they may benefit uh, from digesting our dietary fiber. Uh, we have already uh, scaled up the production of the inulin gel up to um, 20 kilograms and we have prepared a 10 gram daily serving of inulin gel, just like whole yogurt. And we are uh, initiating healthy volunteer study actually within a month. So here at the U of M and our campus, we'll start a healthy volunteer study, uh, studying the impact of the daily inulin gel consumption on changes in microbiome as well as its safety. After that, we'll move on to uh, cancer patient phase one clinical trials. So in addition to uh, this, I wanna talk uh, very briefly about a new project, which is um, uh, a subsequent project that we are following on uh, from the inulin gel study. Uh, there is a lot of um, uh, cases of food allergy and the, as you know, incidence of food allergy is increasing rapidly. There is um, approved, FDA approved uh, uh, treatments against the food allergy from Palforzia, uh, but um, uh, it, 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 not, not all patients are responding well, and a lot of patients uh, fail to respond to Palforzia treatments. What we have shown in the study uh, that I'm about to describe is that inulin gel mixed with the allergen and given orally uh, could sh show efficacy against the food allergy. And I'll show you sh some of the efficacy data in mouse models. What we have shown is that when you mix inulin gel uh, with a uh, potential food allergen, this is ovalbumin, egg white basically, and then give that to food allergy animal models, it can uh, protect mice against the repeated uh, uh, food allergy challenges. What you can see here is that compared with untreated mice that have anaphylaxis-like responses after multiple treatments, uh, multiple gastric uh, challenges, inulin gel plus ova oral garbage can protect them against anaphylaxis, as well as a significant body weight uh, temperature uh, drop in body temperature. Uh, this is just showing uh, the incidence of diarrhea after uh, the oral food challenge. In PBS-treated mice, a lot of them are showing diarrhea as a sign of um, uh, responses to uh, food allergy, uh, whereas inulin gel can protect the majority of mice against uh, diarrhea, as well as anaphylaxis-like responses. We have also uh, shown that this is gut microbiome-dependent phenomena. 
So if you give uh, antibiotics orally, you lose the efficacy of uh, inulin gel, uh, indicating that uh, inulin gel formulated with allergen is going into the GI tract and modulating the gut microbiome uh, to protect the GI tract against the food allergen challenge. We have shown that this works against the multiple food allergy models. We have shown this with a milk allergen, casein, uh, showing very nice protection against uh, casein-mediated medi food challenge. We have also shown this with a food allergy, uh, um, the major food allergy, uh, peanut. So when we formulate inulin gel with a peanut extract and give it orally, uh, we can protect mice against the uh, uh, major food allergy challenge uh, with a peanut. Uh, we are working on the mechanism of action, but we are basically thinking that inulin gel is going into the GI tract modulating gut microbiome while providing allergen to the endurtic cells in an immune tolerizing manner so that in the GI tract, uh, you get immune tolerizing response against the food allergens. So we are actively working on the mechanism of action on that. So with that, I want to thank you for all your attention. I want to thank members of my laboratory who have done excellent work on this project. We also want to thank our collaborators as well as our funding sources. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, James, for such a fantastic talk. Any questions from the audience? Please uh, unmute and ask your question or type your question. I think while people are typing their question, I have a question for you, James. Yes. So what are the differences between human versus mouse sting for the first project? Because I, I remember some of these compounds are selected for one versus other, isn't it? Yes. So the very first thing agonist that was reported in mouse models um, did not work in humans uh, because of a difference in mouse and sting, um, uh, the, the sting receptor. Um, uh, but but the sting agents that we are using in our studies uh, works across the mouse and human sting. So we, we have chosen the compound that's uh, basically uh, sourced from bacteria, and it seems to activate potent immune activation both in mouse and human immune cells. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess my presentation was very clear. <laughs> yeah, I think it was clear as a whistle. <laughs> well, I uh, just want to thank you so much uh, for such a great talk, and uh, we'll stay in touch. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have okay. a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.